the twella zone it's a very important requirement that you need to you need time to digest in, in this information right we, if you are uh, learning a new topic like a law or you are learning a data privacy program management you need time to digest this information go through the relevant content come back and ask question you need to actually do a, a sort of conversation uh, uh, every session uh, every session in my training as a dedicated time to do a q and a right and uh, so you need to actually brainstorm understand ask questions then you move forward to the next content if you don't get the time then obviously uh, if i say that i'll give you a dedicated time at the end of my training you will obviously forget what what did you had in the mind when i when i started a particular topic right so that's the reason i insist having this dedicated 32 hours time slot helps everyone to have a very good understanding of this concept that's a key differentiator if you look at any training institute which is offering the data privacy certification the second of the second is obviously guaranteed low price you can check with any other data privacy certification vendors uh, uh, over there in the market our price is definitely going to be lower approved and certification uh, certified instructor with fip i am an iapp approved uh, certif uh, certification trainer and uh, we will also be doing a career oriented skill based course which means i'll be adding a lot of practical examples during the sessions i'll be giving you my experience which i am doing consulting on a daily basis my past experience of building data privacy program for many big corporations and national identity authorities as well and uh, so starting this course i am also adding a mock exam free which is be part of this course so you will get a free mock test and uh, so you will also get the ebook exam voucher plus one year membership which we discussed earlier and uh, what is the key differentiator as i said the quality time to prepare and uh, sufficient time to digest this complex topic and we are going to do a case study approach with practical case studies which will be uh, touching on each and every topic and templates and other useful resources will be shared from time to time which will be for example how do you build a ropa right how do you do a pi how do you do a dpi all these templates i'll be sharing and even a completed data protection impact assessment as well so all these things i'll be giving from time to time and i'll also take a dedicated exam strategy session so how do you prepare after the end of, during the last uh, fag end of the session i will take this uh, uh, particular very important topic of what are the important materials you should focus for this exam and what are the how do you know that you're prepared for this exam all these things we'll be discussing during that particular strategy session right and also be providing an exam support for instance uh, my, i have so many whatsapp group uh, so candidates keep coming up with different questions whichever they face challenge or trying to uh, understand the logic they can always uh, take support uh, so i'll be always there to support you even after the course in terms of you have a query in terms of a particular question or anything i'll always be there to support you finally career guidance if someone was was just out of the college or someone is uh, uh, actually trying to move Uh, from information security or trying to uh, take up a new domain altogether i'm always there to support you in terms of what, how do you ideally structure your data privacy uh, career to start with right so i'm always there uh, whatever possible support you need from me i'm always there to support you with those conversations we have 10 chapters for cipm course okay so the 10 chapters uh, are covered in the same order in the textbook as well as in the course and it's it's a it's a big blessing because when when you go to cipp e course there are 18 chapters but uh, my training content has 10 modules which is slightly compressed in 10 modules so it's 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 slightly difficult to explain them uh, in terms of how this is getting mapped all right but uh, when it comes to cipm is extremely quite simple and straightforward so you have 10 chapters all right chapter 1 is the most foundational topic of introduction to privacy program management so what are the responsibility of a privacy program manager and uh, what what accountability is there as a privacy program professional in an organization for an organization to implement a data privacy program why should you look beyond compliance this has been a hot topic uh, ever ever since many data privacy laws are coming around the world everyone is looking only from a 
compliance perspective yes of course the penalties are really uh, uh, staggering the amount of fine uh, we thought gdpr is going to be the highest fine but uh, indian uh, dpdp act has come with 250 crores oh, 250 crores is a show stopper right so 250 crores can make companies disappear from the market correct so that's the reason uh, everyone is worried about the legal obligation but it is actually more than legal obligation it's well beyond legal obligation because it is about building trust with your data subjects right so that's can that can actually be a key differentiator for you to thrive in a market as well so we will discuss those things why does an organization need a privacy program and privacy across the organization which means different departments are there within your organization right different departments including your hr your finance your procurement your it uh, there's so many sales uh, marketing there are so many department which has a lot of touch points when it comes to your personal data management right and what role they play when it comes to data privacy and what you should know ideally to manage these departments responsibility and uh, awareness alignment and involvement this is all about your chapter 1 so this is what i generally take as an introduction this is not part of the iapp curriculum but rather i choose to come up with some of the important uh, statements or definitions right so privacy is right to be left alone not intruding someone's personal or family life and uh, second is what is data privacy right of an individual to control and protect his personal data so any data privacy law that is coming around the world is centered around giving the power back to the data subject to question the corporates who are taking the information and making money out of it or monetizing the data right so uh, giving back the power to the data subject to question or have the control over their personal data is data privacy and uh, data protection so data protection is another question is there what is information security and data prote uh, uh, data protection actually data protection is a super set of information security because information security is dealt at a information layer whereas data protection is a level above it we are concerned about data itself which means uh, you don't need to have a structured piece of uh, data which is the information and uh, there are unstructured data which can also have a lot of importance when it comes to data privacy a good example is your biometric templates many a times there could be unstructured data but still they have a lot of value when it comes to data protection so that's the reason uh, data protection is a super set of information security so in data protection what we are concerned is the safeguards and controls which are applied to protect personal data that organization usually uh, uh, involved in the data life cycle right so what is privacy program management we have been using this term that this is going to be the bread and butter of every data privacy professional who is joining as a data privacy consultant in an organization right so it is a structured approach of combining several projects into a framework and a life cycle of protecting personal data and the rights of the individuals this is a very big statement but if you have to you have to break it you can break it in two important parts one how do you have a structured approach of building small small engagements around data privacy into a into a standard format which is your framework and if, with what is the objective the objective is to protect the personal data and ensure the rights of the individuals this is the crux of any data privacy law as well uh, which is not the first part the second part which is protecting personal data and ensuring the rights of the individuals right so why do we need to Im uh, implement privacy program management because it's a key enabler to comply with your legal and regulatory requirements and it meets the expectation of the clients or customers while at the same time it prevents and mitigate the privacy risk so very interesting aspect is when you when you uh, for example there is a breach right and there is a investigation which is going to be done by the uh, supervisory authority or the data protection board which is going to come in india right the first thing that they're going to ask is have you defined your privacy policies and procedure this is the first standard question that's going to come to any company 
right so that's the reason having a privacy program management ensures you have a structured approach you cannot have a wavered approach for example tomorrow every organization in india is going to be focusing only on notice only on consent actually it's not the right approach yes they are important but if you do not have a structured approach you are going to falter in some or the other key important requirement as well that's the reason having a privacy program management is a very very essential factor uh, what is a framework a framework is a skeletal structure needed to support the pr program management right each organization privacy program framework will be created by analyzing the applicable laws regulation and best practices which is customized to the goals of each organization every organization is in a way unique with their own business values their the sector whichever they are working right and what sort of uh, customers they are catering to the culture the regional aspect the language there are so many factors which needs to be considered part of your privacy framework right so what are the framework which are available uh, right now in today's world is nist is a very uh, uh, commonly referred framework when it comes to data privacy and you also have iso 27701 which is also one of the common privacy framework but these framework are not to be applied as is okay these are references but ideally you need to create your own organizational privacy framework right so what is a privacy life cycle these are the different stages that the personal data passes through in an organization right so the privacy governance life cycle includes assess protect sustain and respond we will look at those elements in the short while so this is a very very important slide when it comes to responsibility of a privacy program manager actually this slide is in fact summary summary of what a privacy uh, professional needs to do when he joins an organization uh, with the expectation of fulfilling a privacy program right so it all starts with understanding the business landscape and operation of on employee and customer personal data very very important aspect first of all you need to know when we say personal data personal data always is intended towards customer data but there are other two categories of personal data which also needs to be considered which is your employee personal data as well as vendors personal data okay so employee personal data is equally important to the customer personal data the 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 category which is often neglected is your vendor personal data as well so how does vendor personal data enter your organization for example you have a processor and uh, you have vendors operating in your environment so their information usually comes through the contract or your vendor assessments right so the personal data coming through these channels are also uh, as the obligation to be protected right so understanding your business vertical is again very very important right for example if you are operating in a health sector so if you are operating in a health sector you need to know how health data needs to be protected if you have a us client then hipaa as a regulation which might be triggered right uh, there is uh, if if you are handling children's data if there is a copppa copa there is another uh, regulation which is there so similarly the sector whichever you are working is very very important that you need to understand right so that is all about your first step of understanding your company's business what are the different personal data which is getting collected what are the different business processes that exist within the organization so that is that is itself is a humongous task for someone to get an absolute clarity right second step is identifying your legal regulatory and contractual requirements and develop a applicability matrix for data controller and processor very very important step after you get your initial understanding about your organization now you need to identify what is your legal requirements right what what are the different laws which are applicable right there are many cases the companies are on an international uh, scale for doing business you have customers around the globe right you need to know the laws have extra territorial scope what is extra territorial scope gdpr 
whichever is providing goods or services by specifically targeting a Euro European Union data subject, which means the Indian company indirectly have to oblige with the GDPR, uh, not indirectly, directly have to oblige with the GDPR requirements, right? You may not be aware of it, but definitely uh, this is something which is a very tricky and dangerous zone. If you are not aware of it, you might be uh, uh, sued later on, right? So that is one part. Same with the Indian DPDP Act as well. There is an extra territorial scope which is applicable in this case as well. So for the companies which are processing the Indian uh, data subjects, uh, personal data, so if for the sake of providing goods and services, there is a possibility of uh, triggering the extra territorial scope. So that is the reason you need to clearly understand what are the applicable legal and regulatory and contractual requirements as well. Right, and uh, also understand the obligation as a controller and processor. So, what is controller and processor? These definitions will change from law to law. Right, CAPM is a course which is actually a regulation agnostic course, which means uh, this particular certification is not tied to one particular regulation. It can be uh, used for a professional working in DPDP Act, GDPR, or Australian Privacy Act, or the Canadian, uh, Canadian Privacy Act. So you can, you can work in any regulation, right? But I'll be giving a lot of example from GDPR. That's because of it's considered as a gold standard. Otherwise, uh, it's completely neutral, and you can apply it everywhere, right? Uh, the terminology of data controller and processor is used in many or uh, many laws, which means controller is an entity which uh, which defines the purpose of collection and the ways and means of processing, right? And processor is an entity which is working on the instruction of a controller, right? In Indian terminology, we call it as data fiduciary and data processor, right? So the terminologies are different, but the definitions are the same. Okay, so that makes life easy for everyone uh, when it comes to the definition of core uh, elements, right? The next step is conducting a gap assessment and identifying the existing privacy risk. As a privacy professional or a consultant, right? Once you know the business landscape and once you know your legal and regulatory requirements, the next most important part is conducting a gap assessment. When I say conducting a gap assessment, it, it can be conducted against a law or against a privacy framework or against a specific requirement, right? So in that way, when you do a gap assessment, you can understand your existing privacy risk. So you can easily prioritize what are the significant risks and you can charter a plan how to uh, uh, manage the privacy risk in that particular uh, priority set by the organization top management. So once you have done the gap assessment, the next important step is creating your privacy policy framework or along with your privacy strategy, right? So when I say privacy framework, it includes your policies, procedures. Uh, you may need to review or update or develop your privacy uh, policies, procedures, and templates, right? So this is the very foundational element. Many organization may do certain things, but they do not have a documented policy procedure. So that's again a very critical drawback because the consistency of how an employee applies the responsibility will definitely be questioned if you don't have a documented privacy policy and procedure, right? And uh, that is what we call we call something called uh, uh, like CMMI. We also have privacy maturity model, right? So in that case, you uh, will will have a different variant if you do not have a documented privacy policy and procedure, right? So the next element is defining the governance. So governance, it comes part of your privacy strategy in terms of defining the roles and responsibility and uh, defining the team, team structure and uh, uh, how this uh, organization uh, uh, structure has to work in the, uh, to achieve the vision and mission of the organization. Right. So post that a very important parallel activity which needs to be initiated is your privacy awareness workshop. So privacy awareness workshop is a very critical element in the organization because whatever activities we do part of building a data privacy program, if it is not communicated to each and every important stakeholders who have a role to play in data privacy, then it's going to be a complete failure. The reason is human link 
or humans are the most weakest link of the uh, in the information security or data privacy protection per se right so if they don't have the appropriate knowledge if you look at the root cause of many data privacy breaches that has happened for the last 3 years still human error is at the staggering 35% to 40% right so that's the reason you need to start your privacy awareness program as a very critical element at this point of time and develop your privacy uh, personal data inventory and data flow diagram and data protection controls so once you uh, uh, develop your policy procedures and now you need to build your personal data inventory which means you need to discover the personal data across the organization how uh how do you do it you need to sit with each and every important department understand the business workflow understand the channels where personal data is getting collected and you need to build something called personal data inventory or records of processing activity what we commonly call a gdpr terms right so this is a living document which gives the entire trail of how personal data is getting processed within an organization right it 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 is like it's like your card uh, uh like a, a card of a personal data that gives the entire uh, story of that data how does the uh, data is getting managed within the organization right so this is that you now can the identify the type of controls which you can apply to the personal data protection because without an inventory you cannot randomly uh, apply your data protection controls or data privacy controls same with what we call it as data classification becomes the most critical element to identify the need uh, or the type of personal uh, security control that needs to be applied right similarly inventory is a very critical step here to identify what sort of data protection controls that needs to be uh, implemented right the next step is uh, doing a dpia so dpia doesn't exactly fit in the sequence dpia needs to be conducted uh, at Uh, early at any possible early stage as possible for example if you are starting a new project or a new process or a new product you need to uh, do a impact assessment at a very early stage as possible but if you are starting a data privacy program from scratch so then this dpia may fit here which means you are going to build a dpia process and uh, for all the existing business functions this business process products you need to do a impact assessment so during our sessions we will conduct we will discuss this in deep detail in terms of what are the components of a dpia right then a very critical element which is there in most of the data privacy laws which is your managing data data subject rights so data subject rights is a very very critical element because that's a uh, for example any laws there is a penalty that is always uh, associated with someone not fulfilling data subject rights because that's the very purpose of having the data privacy laws are on the world to give the power back to the data subjects right so uh, how do you ensure a process is created and it is implemented and it is uh, effective to address the grievance of data subject is a very very important role for a data privacy manager in an organization right so there is a lot of aspects that needs to be uh, looked into when you come to data subject rights we will discuss this this particular chapter i think it's chapter 8 of this particular course right so managing data breach incidents and reporting this is again a very uh, uh, critical area because generally organizations have incident management right but how many organization have aligned data privacy breach management along with incident management because uh, the criticality of data breach management is very different can i give an example of gdpr in gdpr you have 72 hours mandate to inform a data privacy breach correct so in this case how critical is for you to do those initial analysis understand the impact of the breach understand the type of uh, uh, impact on the data subject and then you need to also uh, notify the controllers or uh, notify the 
data subject as well as a supervisory authority so that's the reason aligning your incident management with the data privacy breach management is a very very important and critical element we have a dedicated chapter for that as well and finally your continuous compliance uh, program uh, sorry continuous improvement cycle as well as how do you uh, define metrics and how do you evaluate your privacy program for continuous improvement so this is all in fact this is actually an overview of entire cipm uh, course itself right this is what we are going to do in each and every different stage whatever we are going to uh, discuss in different chapters part of this course uh, in gdpr terms uh, publicly available data you don't need to take consent okay it's same as a case with the indian data but it doesn't uh, give you waiver in terms of how do you actually protect the data as well right uh, for example in gdpr there's a very uh, critical question we ask like if you how how sure you are that that the data subject has revealed the data right for example if the data has been leaked by a third party right in that case if you are using that data scrapping the data from internet then you are actually sitting on a time bomb right so uh, in gdpr terms if you are uh, uh, using a data from a third party you need to immediately communicate to the data subject and take the consent uh, it could be done within 30 days that's a mandate that is given uh, the indian law will also come up with sp some specific uh, rules regarding this particular aspect uh, currently whichever is already available in internet that's fine but if you are going to scrape the data on the internet and use it uh, you need to be extremely careful in terms of how do you uh, showcase that that this information was actually revealed by the data subject right so that is something which you need to be taken care hope that answers the question what if indian goes to europe for a vacation what would be covered in etc if you are traveling for a short period of time if you are doing a transit or maybe just traveling for a one or two days so those are so, sort of a typical exemptions which are given so in those cases the extra territorial scope doesn't apply to them right so but if you are going as a student uh, definitely gdpr applies in that case i've been switching to data privacy in gdpr are you home i have experience in uh, i have completed so many big challenges are you i have been answering this question for cssp so you can connect with me uh, there is absolutely no challenge to switch from that what is developing dp dp is they very did i mention mukesh dp i don't know what developing dp uh when when you do gap assessment against which control set standard versus dpia set standard okay uh, that's a good question anshul gap assessment is generally done against a standard or uh, a set of controls or a framework but whereas dpia is not done against them but rather dpia see the first of all the term dpia and pia needs a lot of clarification i'll be clarifying that during a uh, course of the session i don't want to cover a lot of topics on the fly because there's a structured approach what we are going to do but dpia is entirely different the objective of dpia versus a gap assessment is entirely different for instance there is an indian dpdp act which has come into force so for that you need to do something called a privacy impact assessment or a gap assessment whatever you can do but dpia is done on a different note it's it's a terminology which is specifically coined towards gdpr and the trigger for doing a dpia is also specifically mentioned in gdpr all right so the criteria of what you document in dpia is entirely different there is a gap assessment or a privacy impact assessment can be a very exhaustive activity we are going to measure a lot of things right so i don't want to uh, confuse a lot at this point of stage because there is a lot of content we need to discuss down the line right i'll be sharing further information when we discuss assessment chapter all right privacy across the organization so these are the different or uh, departments that exist within the organization so these are the different responsibility of those department as well so i've covered uh, uh, many departments here uh, i'm not going to go through each and every point which is quite straight forward every every department in an organization definitely has some touch points when it comes to personal data management you may think uh, certain department like finance what they are going to do but finance 
generally sanctions payment uh, for the employees uh, they they look they look at your uh, uh, salaries uh, they also uh, pass the bills for the vendors so there is a lot of personal information which is going to go to the finance department as well similarly any department you take in an organization will definitely have some level of personal data touch points so that is the reason you whenever you are building an inventory you need to have an approach we are going to do it based on a process so what are the different process that exist within different departments and for each of this process what is the intake or what is the collection point how the data is getting processed where it is getting stored which application is using it where is the data getting transferred which are the other departments accessing from that department who all have access to that particular data how is the data is getting archived how the data is getting deleted erased all these things are very very critical that's the reason you need to put that effort when you are building a personal data inventory right so there is a lot of examples which i have given here uh, which is which is in terms of different departments and each of the different departments having a touch points when it comes to uh, personal data just look at the slide and also you look at certain elements i can i can brief you if you want me but this is just to showcase you what are the different departments and how do they have touch points when it comes to data privacy dpa done periodically or one initially uh dpa is a continuous activity so it's not a one off activity it has to be done periodically so as i say as i told before it might be done at a initial stage of whenever a product or process or a, 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 any tool has been developed so that is when you do a dpa or pia uh, i'll i'll be briefing all these things in a short while when we go to that particular chapter all right so i hope you get, got a look at these different areas uh, hr is a very interesting area as well because hr has access to huge amount of uh, personal data where from uh, employees or potential employees uh, even vendors and for that sake so uh, hr is a very critical touch point your uh, a procurement is a critical touch point sales and marketing is a critical touch point internal audit team uh someone was asking about internal audit team so internal audit team assess uh, uh when the data pr privacy controls are placed right what are the different data privacy control data protection controls on the place so for example your assessment have a lot of overlap with internal audit team that's why you need to have a synergy with the internal audit team because you're going to sometimes going to measure one and the same right so uh, this actually makes a lot of win win combination when it comes to internal audit team so uh, they also have specific charters developed part of the internal audit and one such is also looking after the privacy uh, uh, law obligations right so internal audit team as i said there is a lot of information is going to go there but when you work together make them understand the importance of these and how to use their assessment part of your dpia or pia is something i generally say as a win win combination instead of doing an assessment from scratch you can ideally use those information which is already getting measured part of the internal audit team all right so the next slide is about the operational life cycle so this entire uh, cipm course is structured into two important parts okay so the two important parts is which is before uh, the operation life cycle we have the privacy program management okay so the privacy program management is basically uh, knowing the fundamentals of your roles and responsibility uh, then creating the vision mission privacy strategy privacy framework and also understanding your legal and regulatory requirements so this is the 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 precursor of developing a privacy program management when we actually implement a privacy program management we are going to follow the life cycle of assess protect sustain and respond so this is called as privacy operation life cycle our entire course is divided into uh, is based on this particular privacy operation life cycle so we will we will look into all these elements one by one uh, we will also have 
uh, another life cycle which is based on the data life cycle for example any personal data which is entering in an organization uh, has a data life cycle which it goes through for starting with uh, create or collecting a personal data and how do we store it how do we use it where do we share it when we archive it and how do we destroy it right so uh, this again has a lot of uh, uh, significance because your privacy controls has to be embedded part of all this critical stages right and we need to know exactly how these important life cycle events are handled by the organization because uh, example retention period which is a very very critical element of when you store the personal data right so if you do not have a proper retention period you're going to uh, definitely have excess data and it's a again a time bomb in your organization because when there is a breach you are again have going to be answering why did you had data which has to be erased or when the purpose is completed ideally you need to dispose the data or delete the data or uh, you need to properly archive it right so these are some of the important controls element which we'll be discussing on the data life cycle perspective as well all right uh these are the core crux of chapter 1 i'm not going to go into much of this uh sorry i just jump into a question so so answer is a okay uh why a data protection officer typically reports to the highest degree of independence which is your top management many of you might think ceo is the top management there is a board uh, which is also there in many organization that's the reason the key word here is top management right uh, ideally they shouldn't be reporting to the cfo or the ceo or the legal counsel many organization do have legal counsel uh, under them there is a data privacy program is aligned but uh, ideally the uh, independence has to be ensured so having them typically reporting to the top management is something uh, very very important to ensure your independence right so uh, the idealistic answer is top management in many small organization they are part of the ceo uh, they report to the ceo or the cio or even to the legal head uh, that is something different but ideally they should have a independence and they should be reporting to the top management but practically it's the uh, actually it depends on the organization see if it's a small organization they can be reporting to the legal counsel but not necessarily if you go to european union uh, especially in gdpr regime they they cannot report to the legal counsel your dpo has to have absolute independence they need to report to your top management all right so i hope that gives clarity let's go to the question number 2 so what should be the first step for developing new privacy program answer is b see uh, even if you go to a top management right you just cannot go to the top management just like that correct so you need to have a proper business plan justifying the effort and cost of the privacy program right so that is something which is the significant first step you cannot jump into any other option because uh, getting a management approval is typically the answer many of you would uh, select if you have other previous certification you will jump on to option d but even to go to a top management and get an approval you need to have a business plan in place so without a business plan without justifying the effort and cost of privacy program you cannot take any other other options which is available all right so that's the reason option b is the 
right answer okay so hope so let's move to chapter 2 so chapter 2 is about developing a privacy program framework and we are going to look into the privacy governance aspect of it all right so this is a very very important chapter because this actually sets the foundation of your the entire data privacy program how do we define a vision and mission statement right and how do you define a privacy scope privacy strategy privacy framework and what are the different frameworks which are available right and uh, just have understanding of the tools as i said we are not going to look into the core aspect of the tool but you should be aware about there is a, there are tools which are available in grc and data privacy scope and uh, how do you structure a privacy team and what are the roles and responsibility right uh, so for each of the chapter i generally give you a exam weightage which is called exam blueprint right uh, i think i'll be covering that in tomorrow or day after session i'll give you an exam blueprint of each of the chapter what is the exam weightage which needs to be uh, which ne- which ideally you need to have an idea that will help you to strategize your preparation all right so very important slide in terms of understanding uh, the key areas of data governance uh, how do you develop a privacy vision and mission statement uh, whatever i say are very important from the exam perspective uh, data privacy vision and mission are not stand alone statements are generally derived from your organizational vision and mission statement right so if your organization has a certain goal and objective usually those goals and objective will help you derive your organizational privacy vision and mission right that something is very very important and uh, that will help you to derive your policies and procedures uh, that is how your entire data privacy framework is developed right and uh, there are different data privacy governance model that exist which is centralized which is a centralized model decentralized model and there is a third one which is called hybrid model uh, i'll give you a quick overview of what is what uh, in centralized model you have a single person or a single group of te- a single team which decides the entire uh, data privacy related decision making and that is drilled down to or passed down to the entire organization and rest of the people just implement it right so this is called centralized model generally this model is useful when for a large organization okay and operating within different uh, uh, state like le- typically let's take there are 20 uh, 30 states in india and there are so many states and it is very difficult to uh, uh, have different members developing different de- uh, data privacy program for a large organization it becomes easy uh, uh, for a central team to take the decisions and just uh, pass on the instruction to the representative to implement locally right so this is called centralized model the second model is called decentralized model so in decentralized model or we call it as flat or local model let's take an example of a uh, a startup a small organization right so generally in small organization what happens is a uh, lot of people even at a a uh, 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 lower level or the people uh, actually get involved in decision making correct uh, so we call this model as a bottom up model the earlier model is top down model so in bottom up model even the people who are at an implementation level they provide their uh, uh, suggestions they play an active role in decision making so that is called as local and decentralized model and the third is hybrid model Now, many many organization typically uh, uh, in a large state uh, they generally go for hybrid model which means uh, there is a top decision making unit like for example there is a uh, a global privacy council uh, there is a global data privacy office and then there is a regional office so what happens is the regional office also plays an active role in terms of implementing or fitting the controls uh, incorporating the regional cultural aspects for example there is a large conglomerate of organization which is working uh, in many countries around the world right so there could be a, a, a global head office but uh, the global head office will create standard set of documents and uh, the standard set of documents again has to be customized as per your uh, particular regions 
right uh, typically example is creating a standard notice but the notice has to be customized for different organization uh, different entities within the member states of european union right similarly in india also you are going to see this difference uh, the notices has to be in the uh, regional language right so that is something again a hybrid model will work best in this case right so this is a classical question which you get most often in terms of which governance model will fit for the organization right so these are the different privacy framework standards and legislations which are available so fipp is fair information privacy practices which is one of the very oldest uh, uh, privacy framework and uh, so it it actually came up with the privacy principles right so uh, most of the privacy principles are still very much relevant across many data privacy regulation as well uh, so the the image has lot of many information but i'm just going to go through whichever is important uh, the next one is copa which is called coppa which is came in 1998 which protects the children's uh, uh, privacy and the next one is pipda which is the canada's privacy law uh, this comes under the legislation perspective apac uh, which is asia pacific economic corporation so they also came up with the specific apac model and gapp is a very 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 uh, commonly referred uh, principles which is generally accepted privacy principle so this criteria for audits and compliance how do you uh, 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 assess an organization's privacy poster and uh, iso 29 uh, 2900 uh, is about security techniques for privacy framework uh, this is i think this is now replaced i guess and uh, we also have consumer privacy bill of rights gdpr came in 2016 enforced in 18 27701 is an isms which is an extension of 27001 uh, which is specifically focused on privacy information management so pims is another uh, framework which you can refer for privacy program management and these are some of the uh, privacy frameworks and regulation and standards so when we come to the class we will have an iapp official slide in terms of what are the things that you need to refer to all right this actually shows the entire uh, chapter 2 in terms of what are the different uh, elements which is there so the outer layer are some of the key principles and uh, that needs to be ensured even if you look at the data privacy act notice choice consent uh, who access the data access controls security retention disposal all these are the core requirements of the laws and then we look into the uh, framework elements which is uh, program governance operating model capability development and demand management right and then we integrate this with the different components of your privacy program management right so these many components are there when it comes to a privacy program management i'm not going to go through each of them in detail but uh, just to give you an overview there are so many aspects where uh, your data privacy program is going to integrate with different departments or process within an organization right right from your change management risk and control management third party risk management uh, uh, new venture or mergers and acquisitions or your uh, your product and process engineering so there is a lot of uh, departments which is going to get uh, integrated when it comes to privacy program management aspect right so this is just a overview of how to structure a privacy program organization uh, uh, hierarchy in an organization so senior management and uh, then you have a data protection office this is just a sample so just don't uh, follow it for every organization it varies from organization to organization so you have data protection office under data protection office you can have different specific departments for example right now we only see a single champion uh, managing most of the data privacy work in many organization but that's going to change uh, if you see the indian dpdp act uh, you will definitely see that uh, uh, 
there will be a dedicated data subject rights management department or a sub department within data privacy portfolio will come up and also you will see concern management breach management all these things will definitely take a shape of coming up a different uh, disciplines within data privacy program management right so uh, that's that's what i'm trying to showcase you that there will be a separate subject matter expert who will be handling different topics like breach management data subject rights management uh, your uh, assessments all these things might have different expert uh, it all depends on the volume and complexity of the organization as well as the size of the organization as well right and uh, we'll also have support from internal audit and legal because uh, you will not be able to work independently without the support of internal audit and legal team so legal team is a very very crucial element when it comes to data privacy because they interpret the legal requirement like uh, instance there is a new law but you will not be able to understand the nuance of every word which is mentioned in the law that's the reason you need the legal uh, department support not only that how do we look into the contracts whenever we are drafting the terms and conditions the privacy uh, uh, spoc as well as the legal spoc has to work together in this case so there are multiple use cases when it comes to integration of uh, privacy team along with the internal audit and legal team right so this is a structure of privacy team and the responsibility of different stakeholders just for your purview uh, th so these uh, levels are not necessarily uh, fit into every organization as i told you looks uh, there's a lot of factors associated with this chief privacy officer privacy leader privacy manager privacy analyst privacy legal counsels data protection officer privacy technologist privacy engineer there are so many roles uh, but all these things will eventually take time uh, for example in gdpr uh, uh, operating regime there are many roles have already been there like there is a cpo or data protection officer you get privacy uh, legal counsel separately you also get privacy technology or privacy engineering team all these things are already having a separate focus right similarly uh, in other growing uh, developing economies also you will see uh, such importance be, will be given to the data privacy domain and you will get uh, a separate subject matter expert for each of these domains as well one way to assess a right privacy framework is that uh, the privacy framework actually is a living document okay so if there are changes in the data privacy laws uh, standards or everything you need to incorporate those requirements so that's the reason privacy framework is a living document right and uh, so also it a key indicator is it improves the consistency of a privacy program across regulation which means if you have a if you have a right privacy framework it helps you to easily transition or easily help you to uh, uh, fulfill the different uh, data privacy regulations across the world right so which means if you have your fundamentals right then it easily helps you to consistently oblige with the different data privacy obligations across the regulations so that is the answer answer b is the best option when it comes to help you to identify how if you are choosing the right privacy framework all right if you remember the privacy model which i was telling you which is centralized decentralized and hybrid based on this what is the right answer
So CIPM is all about how do you look at a problem statement as a privacy manager, right? Most of you have said A, D, and C. So answer to this question, answer to this question is C. Okay, the reason is uh, when we say highly centralized model, it's a central decision making, correct? So if you look at all other option, there is some sort of uh, problem there. This option A is a small to medium size enterprise and uh, it's sourcing fine wines direct from vineyards to its customer with multiple offices throughout India, right? So for a small and uh, uh, medium company, definitely highly centralized model is still possible. And I, I don't know how many of you miss the word except, okay? That's something which you need to be completely aware of. Every question will have such tricky keywords. So you need to focus on them. So here the word is except, which means for all other option, option C is fit uh, of a highly centralized model. As I told you in India, there are so many states. And if you have one central office taking decisions and all other uh, offices can implement it, yes, it works. Highly centralized model, option A works. Uh, what about option B? Again, Car Wash is a large fr franchise of tradespeople performing cleaning services across the United States with all executive managed based in Central Ohio, which is again in US. So this case is also very much highly centralized team can work. Uh, option C, if you see, is a industrial conglomerate with multiple products and services line with separate divisions based in the US, Brazil, and China, which means there are different countries involved, right? And there are multiple products and service lines. So in this case, having a hybrid model will be the best option, right? If you have a centralized team, then decision making for different countries will have a problem, especially involving multiple products and services line. That is the reason highly centralized model will not fit for answer C. Okay. I hope if you have read the word except, okay, that is the key important element which you need to be aware of, right? You'll get a very similar exam questions and exam. So if you understand the reasoning, whichever I'm giving, it will definitely help you. Option D, Funtize is a retail company that sells children uh, toys and games throughout multiple countries in the EU, which means it's within one single territory throughout a variety of different websites, but it is based on Netherlands. Again, in this case, you can very well apply the highly centralized model. All right. I hope everyone is able to get the logic for this question. Look at this question. So this is a very easy answer. It's a living structure that aligns with the changes in the organization, right? Option D is the right answer, which I've been also saying for some time. It's a living structure, living document, privacy framework usually aligns with the changes in the organization, right? So option D is the right answer. Let's look at the next question. What is a key factor that lays foundation and provides direction to all other elements of your privacy program? So answer for this, sorry, sorry, sorry. Answer for this question is C, uh, which is the privacy and vision, vision and mission statement, right? So all other aspects are actually derived after your privacy, vision and mission statement. So answer is C, okay? Uh, so 
i hope most of you got it right so we'll try to look at chapter 3 this is the last chapter which i wanted to discuss for today and uh, we'll see if we are not able to complete we will discuss this tomorrow as well so chapter 3 is in terms of understanding your could you explain decentralized and hybrid again uh okay so let me uh, discuss that at the end of the session i'll try to wind up the chapter 3 to some extent and after that i'll extend the time i'll answer those question explicitly all right so applicable privacy laws and regulation is the chapter is chapter 3 and uh, this chapter we are going to look at the different laws which are existing around the world with with the time whatever we have it's not even remotely possible to discuss the different laws but uh, when you come to my session i'll be discussing the most important data privacy regulations around the world all right and uh, so so these are the different data privacy regulations around the world from the indian uh, so from the exam perspective you don't need to worry that uh, you need to remember each of these regulations uh, some questions at a very high level do come in this chapter but this question this chapter has a very less exam weightage so you don't need to worry about it so these many laws around the world and uh, one common question which you generally get in this in this particular chapter is what are the different common elements across the different data privacy regulations if you go to any data privacy regulations you see a lot of common elements right one is your data subject rights which is going to be very common across the world uh, which is your right to access and right to rectification right so these two elements are quite common across the regulation along with that you need to provide a privacy notice you need to give options which is your privacy which is your choice and then collect your consent so again this sequence is almost same providing a notice providing a choice and then collecting a consent this is also a common aspect across all the regulation this is also common to gdpr dbdp act and everything right and then also how do you limit the purpose for example you collect a personal data for x purpose you cannot use it for a y purpose correct that is called purpose limitation retention limit store the data till you have to serve the purpose of why you collected the data right that is called storage uh, retention limitation principle or you define a retention limit and finally protecting the personal data right so this eight elements are common across all your data privacy laws and regulations right so that is the reason i have been saying the statement like if you have one uh, uh, good understanding of any data privacy law you can usually cater to any other data privacy law in the world right so very very interesting topic and important topic which is your international data transfers okay so this particular chapter uh, i think we have a dedicated chapter i think we may have international data transfer in uh, capm as well so i will cover that in detail there but generally you need to understand these are from the gdpr perspective so in gdpr if you need to uh, uh, transfer a personal data outside the european union you have three important ways to do it we call it as three instruments which are available to to do a data transfer outside the european union so why we are looking at gdpr perspective again this is a sort of a gold standard right when you come to the indian dpdp act what the government has said is uh, sorry what the law says is until you uh, uh, government has uh, created a blacklist of countries so you are free to do a international data transfer but when it comes to gdpr it has charted out what are the uh, ways you can do an international data transfer the first is called adequacy decision so if you if you uh, want to do a data transfer if you look at the adequacy list of countries then uh, if one of the if the country is one of them you can directly go ahead and do the uh, data transfer because uh, there is a mechanism built behind adequacy decision there is there is a entity called european commission european commission has a set of criteria to evaluate countries and if they if they meet that standards then they provide this adequacy decision status so based is that i think right currently we have 17 or 18 countries with the adequacy decision status right so uh, for those countries you can directly do the data privacy uh, personal data transfer the second is safeguards safeguards are the different 
available instruments for an entity level to do a personal data transfer for example first is called sec which is standard contractual clauses typically the contractual clauses which we develop to do a data transfer so after uh, the scrum stood judgment this becomes the de facto model of doing a data transfer so these things i discussed in detail when you come to my cipp course so there is a there is a chapter on international data transfer and transatlantic data transfer history we will discuss all these things in detail there uh, the second one is called ada contracts again these are specific to the supervisory authority approving a customized uh, instrument bcr is binding corporate rules very very important element which is for example an intra group has to do a data transfer right and it is it is based out of multiple countries then you can use binding corporate rules which means there is a big conglomerate of a company and uh, they are situated in multiple countries uh, so in this case they can develop a code which is called B binding corporate rules and any entity which is part of this bcr they can use this uh, instrument to do a intra group transfer which is intra group transfer very very important intra group okay within the uh, sister so concern or children concern within the umbrella right and uh, we also have something called code of conduct and certification mechanism all these things are separate topics i may not be able to discuss that in detail uh, finally we have derogations which are which are exemptions in general okay so concern contract public interest vital interest defense of a legal claim or different uh, 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 derogations which are available to do a international data transfer all right so this international data transfer requirements will vary from country to country so this is based on gdpr so other countries will also have a different set of uh, uh, requirements uh, if you look at sec which is standard contractual clauses which is which is sort of a de facto used for uh, international data transfer there is a requirement to also do something called transfer impact assessment okay which is called tia so part of tia we try to assess the uh, uh, the risk involved in the international data transfer there is a lot of elements which needs to be covered the european union has released a version of what are the mandatory clauses which needs to be included part of the acc all right so we will go in depth all these things in uh, in the cipp classes i think there is a chapter for international data transfer as well in cipm we will look into those elements there all right so i'm just going to cover few questions before we wind up do we have time so if you are working on a multinational company what will give you the guidance of developing a privacy program right and uh, which is beyond a specific law which means you are going to develop a program which is agnostic of a law right so generally industry frameworks which we were referring at nist or iso 27701 these frameworks are generally helpful right so that was an easy question let's go to this question in addition to regulatory requirements and business practices what important factors must a global privacy strategy consider so answer is d that is right uh, which is the cultural norms right so geographical features is not geographical territorial requirements geographical features means is it uh, is it mountainous region or something like that that's a different story so answer is d cultural norms last question for the day the best first step in building privacy operation is the right option is always to start with identifying your legal and regulatory requirements if you don't understand your legal regulatory requirements you're going to make some big flaws later on so the first 
important step is always identifying your legal and regulatory requirements when it comes to building a privacy operation right so all of other activities like doing a risk assessment data discovery will take uh, uh, will be done subsequently the precedence will be always to identify your legal and regulatory requirements all right so that is all i wanted to cover for day 1 